Okay, let's begin. Have you seen the topic on the screen? Are you a Newton person or Leibniz person? Okay, so who invented calculus? Perhaps both of them did. Yeah, we cannot go back and check in the past what really happened. <coughs> but the definition, I mean, I hope you remember your calculus course. Yeah, it just happened last year. So, uh, the definitions of limit, continuity, differentiation, integration, they were not as you study them now, back then. So, uh, Leibniz was born in uh, around 1644 and he died in 1717. So, very long time ago, okay. But um, his definition of continuity is that, I mean, it's something very simple which we all understand but we, which we cannot write down. If two points in the domain are really, really close, then their images are also really, really close. Very simple definition, that's continuity. But what is the definition that we use right now? We say that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that whenever the difference between x and y is less than delta, then the distance between fx and fy is less than epsilon. So, we had to arrive at this particular definition after some time. So, here uh, the definition that you normally know that is called hard analysis because it involves some estimation of parameters. For every epsilon you had to find the delta, suitable delta. Okay? Whereas, the original definition which simply states that if two points are very, very close, then their images are very, very close, there is no estimation involved, it is like soft analysis. Okay? And the link between this hard analysis and soft analysis is going to be the theme of today's lecture. Yeah, I mean, now we, we have been talking about calculus. It does not feel like a logic lecture at all, but there is lot of logic involved in here. So, let me be very precise with what Leibniz originally intended to say. He said that if two points in the domain are infinitesimally close, then their images in the codomain are also infinitesimally close. Okay, that was the original definition. Now, let me write down what is the infinitesimal. Okay, so, say that epsilon is an infinitesimal if well, first of all, its absolute value should be bigger than 0 and the absolute value of epsilon is also smaller than 1 by n for all n in natural numbers. Now, look at this. Yeah, infinitesimal is non-zero, it is positive or negative and it should be smaller than all 1 by s. Can there exist a real number satisfying these properties? If you are smaller than 1 by n and you are positive, uh, smaller than 1 by n for all n and you are positive, then what can you conclude? The number is? 0, but we are also given it is not 0. So, very soon people realized that oh, this definition does not make sense because the uh, thing is that infinitesimals do not exist in R. 
okay then this definition was meaningful but also meaningless what was the definition of continuity that if yeah continuity is that continuity of f let's say from r to r is for all x y in the domain if mod of x minus y is an infinitesimal then mod of fx minus fy is so too okay so now this definition the idea was picked up obviously because right now that's what we say yeah for all epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta greater than 0 such that whenever the difference you can make the difference between two points in the domain as small as possible and then here it will become as large as possible now here we are particularly talking about real numbers okay can you tell me some properties of real numbers i mean some structures on real numbers you, you, it's an ordered field okay good yeah it's an ordered field so let me quickly remind you order is a binary order we are talking about strict order let's say then field means it has addition which is associative commutative it has identity and inverse then multiplication is also associative commutative has identity it distributes over addition and most importantly every non zero real number has a multiplicative inverse okay now if at all our real numbers were to have infinitesimals which are very very small and close to zero then their multiplicative inverses should also exist we want it to be a field yeah multiplicative inverses should exist and because it's an ordered field it should be bigger than every natural number you understand yeah so if infinitesimals do exist then infinities will also exist of course our real numbers do not have these properties but for around so let's say the newton and leibniz discovered this in late 17th century now until 1950s people couldn't really figure out the mystery behind this definition of continuity okay how many years it took around 300 years okay for 300 years nobody could figure out what are these infinitesimals because even in definition of differentiation we also use something similar very small change in the value of the function divided by a very small change in the value of the variable everywhere the same idea was being used later on people found the hard analytic analogs of that okay so then enters a logician abraham robinson in 1960s and he has got many quotes you can see yeah this idea is not really meaningless we have to expand our field of real numbers okay so infinitesimals do ex exist infinitesimals and infinities do exist in an extension of r so our job today is to figure out what this construction is what this extension is so uh, one simple thing yeah i mean we know what real numbers are 
can we try to construct something more complicated from real numbers. So, one simple thing is that let us go to the next slide and let us try R2. How is the addition defined on R2? Component wise addition, what will be 0 for addition? 0, 0. Uh, is this addition associative, commutative? Yes. Can multiplication be defined? Complex huh? Complex numbers. Uh, complex numbers is one possible way, but we uh, we also need order. Complex numbers do not have an order relation. So, what is the most natural way to define ordering here on pairs? Component wise, yes, component wise ordering, component wise ordering, component wise multiplication, but there is a big problem. Yeah, so uh, let me point this out to you that if I take 2 comma 0 and multiply it by 0 comma 3, then I will get 0 comma 0. Are these two elements to begin with? 0. So, two non-zero elements will multiply to give me a 0 element. So, this, this property is called integral domain. Okay. So, this says that not an integral domain. So, every field is an integral domain, but well, R2 is not an integral domain, so it cannot be a field because for example, 2 comma 0 does not have a multiplicative inverse. What can it be? Half comma what? Infinity? Infinity does not exist. Okay, this same problem will persist if I even go to R cube. So, let us make our set very, very large. So, let us talk about r to the power n. Yes. So, can we use min or max to define min? min and max can be used to define something, but that will still not give you a field. So, yes, I mean your question is really good. So, I would like to say something about that. So, if with real numbers, you take your addition to be min and multiplication to be addition, then addition distribu multiplication distributes over addition, which means addition distributes over min relation. Okay, uh, if you want some identity for min, what will it be? additive identity for min. So, it should be something like min of x comma something is x. So, what should x uh, this something be? Larger than everything, it should be plus infinity. Okay, so, if I formally add a symbol called plus infinity, I take real numbers union plus infinity and then I define min and plus as my addition and multiplication then it is called a tropical semi-ring. Okay. So, tropical because in, it was invented in Brazil. So, that is what Europeans called it. Okay. But it is a semi-ring. Yeah. The main property it lacks is that it has multiplicative inverse. Okay. Multiplication is addition. So, addition has inverses, but it lacks additive inverses. Because min of x comma something can never be infinity, right? So it's a it lacks the property on addition part. So to answer your question, yes, people call it tropical semi field, but we don't really want to go there. Yeah, we still want to maintain our usual addition multiplication and uh, we want to have less than relation. 
yes zero into e is one uh, what is that e once you add some symbol e to this collection of real numbers then you also have to add its multiplicative inverse you also have to define how to add those things so you have to take the field generated by real numbers and your new symbol yeah so yes it can be done but right now i don't think you are in the position to understand that okay so uh, now we want to work with this r to the power n n for natural numbers so what is this collection of all sequences natural number indexed sequences of real numbers so how do we write an element a sequence an okay how is the addition defined let me write that for you so addition is defined an n uh, i mean i am not always going to write this yeah n in n okay plus bn how is the addition defined component wise so an plus bn n how is the multiplication defined well you simply take multiplication here how is the order relation defined order relation an n less than bn n if there exists a capital n, there a capital n okay in natural numbers such that for all small n greater than capital n bn minus an is greater than 0 for all small n greater than capital n uh huh uh, bn minus an is greater than 0 so an my the real numbers bn and yes interesting why do you come up with this definition rather than the usual component wise You are on the right track. This set won't be convergent. Yeah, this works with convergence if we consider that. This works with convergence. So, so convergence is on your mind. Okay, fine. I mean the normal definition would be component wise. Yeah, I mean this is first option. The second option is that component. for all n in n, a n is less than b n. Component wise or I mean uh, let me say less equal and here let me put less equal. but the problem with this definition is how do you compare 1 comma 3 yeah and 3 comma 1 can these two pairs be compared i mean i'm uh, i'm not talking about this particularly 1 comma 3 and 3 comma 1 they are not elements in rn but if you consider them above yeah so 1 comma 3 and 3 comma 1 are incomparable with point wise comparison so because we are allowing lot of flexibility yeah so we are also losing some information okay so the second definition doesn't work because it's not a linear order yeah this is not a linear order okay the first definition still has some merit yeah but we have to uh, now the, this is interesting i will give you one particular example if your definition is that there exists an n such that like eventually you are comparable the first fi finitely many terms you can say they are not really comparable it doesn't matter you ignore them eventually they are comparable now what will happen with this sequence okay tell me with first definition uh, i am taking 1 0 2 0 3 0 and the second sequence is 
zero one, zero two, zero three, and so on. Are they comparable? No, so they are still not comparable. Yeah, we still have some problem. Although we are understanding something over there. Yeah, the first definition, uh, first attempt is much more valid than the second attempt. We are trying to get closer towards this. Yes. Just one person at a time. I don't know. Okay, you are suggesting lexicographic ordering. Yes, lexicographic ordering is one way to do this. But we also have the problem. Remember that this is not a field. Yeah, this is not an integral domain. Sujal. Smaller than or equal to? Smaller than or equal to? Like here, you are asking me to put this. N is less than capital N. Oh, I mean, you are only willing to compare something in the beginning, and nothing like nothing else matters. Yes. Norms, norms of these vectors. In wi which norm are you talking about? L2 norm is every single sequence in Rn <laughs> integrable with respect to L2 norm? No. Ah, okay. And this class doesn't know norms yet. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. So uh, it's not integrable. L infinity will also not work. Yeah. L infinity is supremum. It also won't work. It's not square summable. Not every sequence is square summable, right? So therefore, we still have some problem. So the the solution here is an equivalence relation. Okay. So solution is identify some sequences. Okay, now how do we identify? So say that A n is equivalent to B n if the collection of those indices where A n is equal to B n is large. I mean, it should be large, yeah. It shouldn't be something small. Okay, you might say at this point that I have just converted my problem into another language. Yeah, so this collection should be large. The collection of indices where they agree should be large. Now, what is the definition of large? Now, what should be large? Now, let us write down some properties. First of all, do you want empty set to be large? Yeah, because like two sequences do not agree anywhere and then you identify them. That does not make sense. So, empty set is not large. Do you want the full set to be large? Do you want to identify a sequence with itself? Yes, so n is large. Then if x subset of n is large and x is a subset of y, then what can you say about y? Can you see where we are going? Huh? Countable? No. Okay, uh, one final property. If x and y are large, what can you say about x intersection y?
if x and y are large then so is x intersection y definition of filter okay so voila boolean algebras and filters are not leaving us okay one more thing that was a problem here you observe this 102030 blah 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 and 010203 you couldn't compare them really that's because the, this is zero everywhere except for odd numbers and that is zero everywhere except for even numbers so well odd and even the best thing about them is that they are complements so we would like something more to be true that if a set is large then its <laughs> complement is small so i am going to add ultra filter okay so now you probably understand why we defined ultra filters in a particular way ultra filters capture the notion of large subsets of your given set now okay one particular type of ultra filter that we have studied that is a principal ultra filter so an ultra filter is principal if all of them share a common element yeah it is generated by an atom in the boolean algebra which boolean algebra are we talking about over here the power set of natural numbers okay so an ultra filter on n is an ultra filter in the boolean algebra of power set of n okay now we still have to go a long way yeah to verify that this actually works okay so uh, i haven't written this last property but please mention maybe i should write it down yeah so that you will have it on your record that if x is large then n minus x is small yeah the complement is small so we want ultra filters so let let u be an ultra filter on n i e an ultra filter in the power set of natural numbers say that an is u equivalent to bn if the set of all indices such that uh an and bn agree this is in u means it is large so the idea here is that uh this is a note <coughs> we often want u to be non principal okay not principal means it doesn't contain any finite set yeah i e u does not contain any finite set if it contains a finite set then it must contain a single term i showed that to you yeah in in the exam answers there was one midsem problem 
okay so uh, it cannot contain any finite set and it has to make decision for every single subset odd and even they are complements so either odd is in u or evens are in u any questions so far this is simply a definition yeah nothing more is happening yet now we have to check lot of things how do we define addition how do we define addition of the equivalence classes okay let's write down a set star r to be r to the power n modulo this equivalence relation so the elements of star r are the equivalence classes of sequences okay so the set of hyper real numbers okay star r is the set of hyper real numbers you can actually start with any structure in logic and construct its hyper structure but here we are doing it for hyper real number yeah for real numbers okay first things first addition what is addition so i take an equivalence class of a sequence and i add another equivalence class to it how should i define it equivalence class of this point wise sum okay so this is an plus bn point wise and the equivalence class of that but as is always the problem with equivalence classes you have to make sure addition is well defined ha huh? yes very good we want that tilde u is a congruence relation yeah need tilde u is a congruence relation okay so let us check that suppose for addition we are going to check it suppose this an is u equivalent to an prime and bn is u equivalent to bn prime then we have to check that an plus bn is u equivalent to an plus bn okay uh, an prime plus bn prime yeah we need to check okay an plus bn the u equivalence class is sorry the sequence is u equivalent to an prime plus bn prime okay what does the first condition tell us that an and an prime are u equivalent what does that mean there is a large set over which, a set over which they agree so uh, the collection so we know that the collection of all those indices such that an equals an prime and the collection of all those indices such that bn equals bn prime they are both large this is given yeah this is our assumption that they are both large now what will happen the collection of all indices where an plus bn will agree with an prime plus bn prime what can you say about this particular set this is 
it is at least their union intersection not union yeah if two sequences agree yeah i mean maybe these things agree somewhere if this one agrees at 4 an and an prime agrees at 4 but this one doesn't necessarily agree at 4 that can happen yeah so but you, can you verify that this contains the intersection uh, let me call this x1 and let me call this x2 then it contains intersection of x1 and x2 see what i am saying is that if for a particular n an is equal to an prime and bn is equal to bn prime both of them happen then obviously an plus bn is equal to an prime plus bn prime for that particular n so therefore we know this yeah that the other side is x1 intersection x2 is contained inside this now x1 intersection x2 u is an ultra filter so therefore x1 intersection x2 must belong to u and also the second property always that it is closed under upper bounds so since this is contained so this belongs to u and this implies that this belongs to u okay so therefore we actually get that this addition that we have defined here is well defined similar thing will work with multiplication yeah so multiplication is also defined point wise okay now uh, if we are done with addition and multiplication i am just going to write down a dot over here and another dot over here so that addition multiplication is okay subtraction like minus sign it will work automatically you don't need to check anything now what is remaining well what is zero what is zero it is the equivalence class of the constant zero sequence in fact yeah in fact uh there is a there is a natural inclusion from r to star r which takes x to the constant x sequence is equivalence class okay now something is still remaining so we have defined addition zero one also can be defined using this process now we have to check whether this is actually an integral domain or whether it is a field how do you check that something is a field or not field means every non zero element should have a multiplicative inverse now tell me how do we check that what is the meaning of non zero yeah we need to check that if an the equivalence class of an is not equal to the equivalence class of zero then how to define the inverse any ideas if it is not zero then if it is not zero then what happens there is a small number of zero elements in the sequence 
Okay, so there is so uh, yes, the set of this implies that the set of all n's, set of all indices such that a n is equal to zero is is small. Okay, is small, and then what can you do? Very good. So, replace all the entries in this sequence. So, let me call this x. Replace all entries in a n for n in x by 1, for example, to obtain a n prime, then can you check that this is also, yeah, then the sequence a n and the sequence a n prime, they are u equivalent. Can you verify this, that these two sequences are, because they only differ by like at most they differ on x, they cannot differ anywhere else. Okay. So, a n and a n prime are equivalent and now every element of a n prime is non-zero. Okay. So, each, each entry in a n prime is non-zero. So, define the inverse of the original sequence to be a n prime inverse this sequence. Okay. So, but now let us go back yeah, a couple of slides. Look at this 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0. This is non zero only on evens, uh, odds. Yeah, this is always zeroth location. Uh, sorry, evens. Yeah, non zero on evens, and the other side is non zero on odds. Now, either the set of even numbers is u large or the set of odd numbers is u large. So, one of them is 0. So, let us say this is 0. The set of even numbers is uh, is large. Yeah, the set of even numbers is large. So, I can change the entries, all the even entries to something else. Oh, sorry. Odd, odd entries to something else. Fine. So, if uh, let me use green color here, if the set of even numbers belongs to u, then this is not equal to 0, correct? Because I can change all the odd entries to something else and then its inverse is and hence its inverse is what is the inverse tell me 1 comma 1 comma half comma 1 comma 1 by 3 comma dot 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 you always keep alternate ones you replaced these zeros with ones and then you wrote this down and now you can check its multiplication is 1 almost everywhere. Means almost everywhere means it is equal to 1 on a large set of indices. Whereas, this is equal to 0. The second entry is actually 0 because you can change anything in the odd indices. So, therefore, I can change everything to 0 and this is 0. Do you get this? 
yeah evens and odds they are complements so by the last property of ultra filter this must happen only one thing is remaining now we have shown that every non zero element has a multiplicative inverse we haven't discussed the order relation okay so recall for addition we just said point wise now for multiplication mm, sorry for uh, comparison so say that the class of an is less equal the class of bn if the set of all indices such that an is less equal bn is large we actually have to use this so you don't check for comparison everywhere you only check it over a large set of indices okay now uh, we have to check that this is actually a linear order okay why is it reflexive why is it reflexive is an less equal an where do they agree everywhere so reflexive because natural numbers are always large symmetric do you need to check anything Ant anti symmetry anti symmetry yeah anti symmetry what is the meaning of anti symmetry that if an is less equal bn and bn is less equal an then then you have to use the intersection and an upper bound same thing yeah so anti symmetry is also done i want you to write this down yeah properly transitivity so maybe an is less equal bn and bn is less equal cn so now the set of indices where this inequality is observed and the set of indices where this inequality is observed you just simply take their intersection and again everything works yeah take intersection and it will be an upper bound one more thing that is trichotomy well do it as an exercise this will work yeah trichotomy will also work this is actually a linear order so let us re rewind for a moment we started with real numbers we wanted infinite decimals so therefore we started looking for some higher and higher structures r square did not work r to the power n did not work but r to the power n modulo an equivalence relation well that does work but where are infinite decimals so now consider the sequence 1 by n i claim that this is an infinite decimal now can you verify that 1 by n is strictly bigger than the zero sequence yes because it is bigger than zero everywhere okay then uh, this is less than 1 over k constant 1 over k okay 
observe what I am writing. Yeah, 1 over k is the constant sequence indexed by n. Yeah, this is less than this. Is this true? Yes, why? Why is this true for each? Because it's finite? No, I mean, uh, what is the graph of this sequence? Compare the graphs. 1 over n looks like this. And 1 by k is a constant graph. So, 1 over n is always going to go below the graph eventually. Yeah? So, Yes, so 1 over k will always be somewhere like this. Yes, and we need to show this. And how will you do that? All cofinite subsets, I said that often our uh, ultra filter needs to be non principal. So, assume it is non principal. Okay, so assume non principal. Uh, so, assume u is non principal, then. <coughs> Then each cofinite subset is u large, means it is an element of u. And here that is precisely ha what is happening. Yeah, after some point, a tail of natural numbers will witness this less than. Correct? So we are done. So, we got an infinitesimal and this is also not something that you haven't seen before. Yeah, but it's just that for 300 years nobody saw this. And what is infinity? So, the sequence n is infinity. Yeah, so n is infinity. So, this branch of analysis and model theory is called non-standard analysis. Okay? So, uh, there is a very beautiful blog by Terence Tao from 2007, uh, Ultra Filters and Ultra Limits, a bridge between soft and hard analysis. Okay? So, I recommend you to check it out. So, this is non-standard analysis. We have to see something more about this. We are not yet done with non-standard analysis. In tomorrow's lecture, we will see more. And we will do this construction. This is called an ultra product construction. Yeah, this star r, the way we defined it, we will do this ultra product construction then prove a theorem called Wash's theorem and use that theorem to prove compactness for uh, predicate logic. Yeah, that is our plan. Com because ultra products of structures actually provide us with average structures. Statistical averages you are familiar with. So, these are model theoretic averages. You are given a bunch of structures and you construct their average structure. It has average properties. Okay, so, that will be our way of proving the compactness theorem. Let us stop here.